So this is essentially the, the third video in the Berniston story, really. Uh, and it's about the vicar, John T. Hartley's opponent in the men's Wimbledon final of 1879, a chap called Mr. V. St. Ledger de Gould. He was born in 1853 in Clonmel, in Tipperary, to a sort of an Irish arist aristocratic family who lived at Court House. I think that was in County Cork, I'm not sure. He excelled at sport, this fella. And uh, he was a gentleman and very popular with. Dublin High Society and he worked for the Boundary Commission in, uh, in Ireland which of course was all Ireland at the time there was no division as there is now that didn't come until the, the sort of 1920 or thereabouts he was a Sort of a good boxer, sailor, even jockey. Uh, but he excelled at this new game, lawn tennis. And he became Irish champion in 1879. Decided to enter the men's world championship at Wimbledon in the same year. He was beaten in the final by the Reverend John Thornycloft Hartley, who was vicar of Burniston, a small a small village in North Yorkshire. Now, being the darling of the jet set of the day, this defeat didn't sit easily with him. He, he, he was a bit wrangled by it. Uh, wasn't good for his ego. Uh, and the following year he entered uh, another championship at a rather prestigious tennis club in Cheltenham and was beaten by a chap called William Renshaw. Now, he met this William Renshaw again and he defended his, his Irish Championship the following year and Renshaw absolutely thrashed him. The same Renshaw going on to be Wimbledon men's champion seven times as I mentioned in the, uh, in the previous video. So the gold being sort of his ego thoroughly bruised by all of this, he became heavily addicted to alcohol and, uh, and the drug of the day opium. About ten years later, in 1891, he met a dressmaker. And what a shop in at 22 Hereford Street in London. She was of French origin a Miss Marie Violette Girona. Marie Girona had been married twice before she met Gold. When she was 17 she married a local lad in France but her father didn't approve. And the marriage only lasted a week and then she, she cleared off. Uh, first of all to Geneva where she had a shop and then eventually to London where she opened a rather posh dress shop in, uh, in Hereford Street. And she became a companion to uh, a sort of rich, a rich widow, I think she was. Um, 
and uh, accompanied her out to India. Now this first husband had seemingly died <laughs> very very quickly and so she was free to marry again and she married uh, a British army officer called Wilkinson out in India. But he didn't last very long either. Within two years he was dead also. And uh, when she returned to London uh, to this shop she wasn't wildly attractive according to the people of the day. But she had uh, certain French charm, let's put it, let's put it like that. Uh, very expensive tastes and, uh, and she was all of a flirt with those who she thought would be to her advantage. Especially those who, who, seem, to be, who seem to have a bit of cash. And gold certainly fell into that uh, into that trap. He was charming, well spoken. He was entertaining company, uh, and although not wealthy, I'm not sure that Mrs. Yuzhirodan knew that at the time. He moved in the right circles. They were eventually married in uh, 1891 and they rented a big house in the West End of London where they entertained lavishly the society of the day. But uh, they couldn't keep it up. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't have the money to keep it up. This, the shop provided very little, and gold, of course, was blowing all his money, what he had on gambling, bows and, <laughs> and opiates. So they, uh, they did a runner. When the landlord went to uh, the house in the West End, <laughs> it would seem that sold all his furniture <laughs> to pay for the next of your lifestyle. Anyway, for a few years nothing was heard of them, but in, in 1897 they showed up in Montreal, of all places, in Canada, where Mrs. Gold started another classy dressmaking shop while Gold himself spent all his time <laughs> gambling the money away, uh, as usual, not to mention his booze and, and, and drugs. In 1903, Gould claimed that his, his older brother, who was the fourth baronet, as it were, had fallen off a horse and, and was killed. And he was going back to England to claim the title. It was a monumental lie, as it turned out, <laughs> as you'll see later. Uh, but he, he showed up in Liverpool where he set up a laundry business and he imported sort of machinery from the United States of America for this. And he seemed to do quite well because he, he bought up other local laundries and expanded his business. And uh, Mrs. de Gould, she followed him shortly afterwards, leaving the, uh, this rather posh dressmaking shop in the hands of a manageress who sent them uh, the sort of profits from the shop on a regular basis. De Gould decided to call himself Sir Vere, St. Ledger de Gould, <laughs> and his missus became Lady St. Ledger de Gould, although he had no right to do it. <laughs> and they were living way, way beyond their means. The profits from the shop in Montreal dwindled away to nothing, and eventually the shop was shut. But Mrs. de Gould, she had seemingly been given a system for gambling which couldn't fail 
I think it was for roulette. And the gold being under her thumb, he was persuaded by her to go to Monte Carlo to try this system out. And uh, they rented a plush apartment in the Villa Minasini, which was uh, on, uh, I think, the, what was the address? 14 Boulevard de Moulin in Monte Carlo. started hanging around the casino. Monte Carlo at that time was a really louch place. I mean it was full of uh, sort of aristocrats down on their luck and uh, young women ex looking to pick up rich men and uh, it was a real debauched place. The De Gaulle's took their uh, beautiful niece with them, uh, a girl called Isabel. And she the system, Mrs. de Gould's system, it was seemingly successful for a very short space of time, but as always, uh, it failed. And before long, they were absolutely up to their eyeballs in debt. They became what was called at the time grifters, essentially con men. Um, I mean, Monte Carlo was full of them, as were most of the uh, sort of gambling capitals of, uh, of Europe. They were on the lookout for lonely, rich, divorced, or widowed women who were essentially looking for company and didn't mind having to pay for it if necessary. One such woman was a Danish woman, Mrs. Emma Levin, or Levin. <laughs> She'd been brought up in a children's home. She's a pretty unfortunate upbringing. Her father had scarpered. Um, and she was known to the police as being a bit of a, a bit of a loose young lady when she was a teenager. And she'd also been in hospital to be treated for syphilis, which says an awful lot. But she was quite attractive and she had a hell of a figure. And, uh, a rich Swedish businessman fell for her and married her. So she really landed on her feet. But it was a it was a very unhappy marriage and there were no children. And when he died, she was left this a rich widow and took herself off, well first of all to Milan, but then she ended up in Monte Carlo. She fancied herself as a demi mondaine, someone on the edge of this Louch Society in, in Monte Carlo. She smoked cigars and flirted with young men who uh, fancied their chances and flaunted her, uh, her very expensive and extensive jewellery. It was, worth, it was worth a small fortune. Her friends kept warning her that she was, she was asking for bother and bother came in the shape of the ghouls. <laughs> They saw easy pickings and, uh, and they befriended her and she was taken in. She was taken in by the titles, Sir Veer and Lady Marie. Uh, and they had beautiful English manners. I mean, he was, he was well brought up with uh, Veer de Gould. And of course they had with them the beautiful Isabel, their niece, or her niece who was very, very popular with a younger, rich set. But the girls persuaded her to lend them some money, as was their way. They 
been doing this all around Europe, as it turned out. Uh, taking the money and then doing a the runner without repaying it. Now, Mrs. Levin's companion, Mrs. Katsalasi, saw herself being pushed out by Marie de Gould. And uh, the upshot was that they had a, a no holes barred cat fight inside the casino, which was a, an absolute disgrace. And uh, Mrs. Levan, being tarnished by this, decided that she was going to leave Monte Carlo until everything had settled down. A note had been shoved under her door in her hotel saying that the ghouls, that the ghouls were, uh, were frauds essentially and uh, so she decided she was going to ask for the return of this loan which was quite substantial you know, a thousand francs or more and uh, she was invited to the Villa Menasini to discuss matters by the de Goulds. She went there for afternoon tea, about five o'clock, where things took a turn for the worse in a major way. She never returned from the Villa Menasini to her hotel, which was the Hotel Bristol, and she was reported missing by this companion, Mrs. Casalazzi. Now the ghouls by this time were on the run to London. And they got as far as Marseille. And in Marseille they left the, a big trunk and another big bag at the left luggage office. While they made their way to find an hotel for the night. The porter in the left luggage office, a chap called Pons, he noticed that this big trunk absolutely stank, putrid, and there was blood leaking out the bottom of it. And the following day, he raised this. with the goals and, and, and they tried to fob him off by saying it was, it was freshly killed chickens <laughs> which they had in this thing and Mrs de Gould tried to bribe him, offered him a bribe to uh, just turn his back and forget all about it but Pons called the police and uh, when they came and opened up the, this trunk and this bag what they found it was just they just could not believe it Inside the trunk was Mrs. Levan's torso, minus head, arms and legs, which were found in the other bag. <laughs> and later on, her entrails were found hanging on a spike somewhere along the road between Monte Carlo and Marseille. They were also in possession of Mrs. Levan's jewellery and a sizable amount of cash. And they were arrested. And uh, they were tried in Monte Carlo. Gould claimed that Mrs. Levan had come to ask them for money to pay one of her young lovers. And when he refused to to do this, not that he had the money to do it anyway, Mrs. Levant had gone berserk and had bit his, had bit his missus on the hand and become hysterical. And when he was trying to subdue her, he coshed her <laughs> with a pestle which he was using to grind up some chemicals to develop some photographs. So that was, that was sort of the first excuse.
Then he claimed that while he was out of the room, one of these young lovers had obviously come in, had this row with Mrs. Lever and, and done the dirty deed. But eventually he, he had to own up to it. Uh, he owned up to the killing. But he, he claimed it wasn't premeditated, as the, as the prosecution had suggested. They'd suggested that it had been Mrs. Gould's idea and he, being an absolute over, had, had done the, her bidding in order to get her jewellery and, uh, and any money she had. I mean, Vida Gould denied this. Uh, he, he, uh, but the court, I think, were inclined to believe that uh, he was definitely under her thumb and it was her idea. It was a sensation and the, and the press came from all over the world to listen to the grisly details of this case in the courtroom. I mean, the public gallery was absolutely packed. Having realised she was dead, they then carted her into the bathroom and left her in the bath. But uh, courage failed the goal. He he, uh, he 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 couldn't he couldn't cut the body up. I mean, why why they thought about cutting the body up and taking it with him is beyond my comprehension. But I, I suspected just hope that she would disappear. Um, but why shove it in two trunks and, uh, and ask for them to be delivered to, be delivered to London? <laughs> it's, it's, well, you just can't understand it at all, but that, that was the situation. What complicated matters more was Isabel had returned uh, from her outing. Um, and, and she was told to keep away from the bathroom. It, it, and it was locked. Whether she quitted it or what, I have no idea. But obviously the following day they wanted her out of the way. She had wanted to go on a trip, which she thought they would flatly refuse to allow her to do. But of course they were mad keen. <laughs> and so that was her out of the way while they while they carved this body up, while they butchered this uh, Mrs. Levin. Anyway, at the trial, the press had a field day. I mean, well, uh, these are just a couple of photographs of the front of two French magazines. I mean, this woman was 57. I mean, but one of the magazines gave her, <laughs> gave her the torso of a woman, <laughs> a woman, I would think, about 25. Uh, I suppose, typically French. At the end of the trial, the girls were found guilty, which wasn't surprising. Uh, Via St. Ledger de Gould was uh, sent to do a lifetime's hard labour on the Ile de Diable in the penal colony of French Guyana in South America. I mean, it's a better known as Devil's Island from the uh, film Papillon, which starred Steve McQueen and uh, Dustin Hoffman. His wife was sentenced to death, which in 1907 meant the guillotine. Uh, but it was reduced to, uh, to life imprisonment. I mean, while she'd been on remand, Via de Gold had suffered badly from uh, cold turkey because he, he didn't have access to his <laughs> to alcohol and drugs. I mean, on one occasion he, he'd gone berserk in his cell, uh, thinking that someone was trying to saw his legs off. I mean, the court obviously thought he was a wreck under the uh, under the thumb of his wife and.
her histrionics during the trial certainly did nothing to help her case. I mean, it was also being suggested that she had uh, she had form as both of her husbands had died shortly after marrying her, which again wasn't very helpful. In 1908, Vera de Gould embarked from St Martin de Ray, which is a port on the uh, west coast of France, the Bay of Biscay. On the ship, the Liberty. which was bound for the main town in French Guiana, uh, Saint Laurent de Moroni. Once they arrived there in this main town, the prisoners were dispersed to the various prisons around the colony. In the Gould's case, it was Devil's Island. I mean, while, while I was crossing the Atlantic in this boat, or this ship, the Loire, uh, a Dr. Colin Leon took a couple of photographs of, uh, of the gold, uh, which you can see here. What's on the boat, the gold also wrote about his life and crime in uh, three school exercise books, which came into the possession of this uh, Dr. Leon. And, and they were only discovered recently in 2000 and something uh, by his grandson amongst thousands of photographs which uh, Dr. Leon had taken about his time in the French Guyana colonies uh, where he was he was outraged by the terrible conditions that the prisoners had to endure there but uh, seemingly had no success in changing matters. I mean the colony was finally closed in 1953. The climate was absolutely appalling hot and humid, mangrove swamps everywhere, insects by the zillion. Tropical diseases were, were, were rife and killed thousands and thousands of prisoners. When the time was up, many prisoners were, uh, were encouraged to stay in French Guyana and, and colonise the place, and some did. Some stayed out there. I mean, some of them became employed by the prisoners that had recently been imprisoned in. Very, very few returned to France. Anyway, there was no such luck for the gold. By now, he was just a shadow of his former self. I mean, he was in his, well into his fifties. I mean, other prisoners, knowing of his aristocratic background and the, the fact that he might have some wealth tucked away somewhere, the fact that he was English didn't help. He was bullied unmercifully. I mean, I mean being a very intelligent bloke, unlike most of these others, um, 
but didn't speak but unable to speak French or to have a conversation in French meant he was a, he was a very lost soul really and of course he was suffering from drug withdrawal and of course he was very much in love with this uh, with his wife um, and of course he didn't know what was happening to her It would seem that he was transferred very quickly back to the the Hat prison on the mainland of French Guyana. Where the uh, pastor of Saint Laurent de Moroni had met with him several times. Gould had, had, had apparently been overjoyed to have several intelligent conversations with this pastor. But he was uh, he was weak, he was ground down by fevers, he was bedridden, his extremities were being gnawed away at by rats. Uh, he had absolutely no prospect of uh, of a reprieve. Uh, no prospect of any release at all. Um, he was suffering from alcohol and opium withdrawal and uh, it would seem that he killed himself in 1909 which at age 55 it was less than a year after he'd arrived in the place. It was a terrible end for a chap who'd been, you know, boundary commissioner in in Ireland, he was a tennis champion, he was an excellent boxer, he was a sailor, a jockey, he was well mannered, he was convivial, he was adored by many people and uh, he was a gentleman right to the end. How sad. Meanwhile, his opponent at Wimbledon, John Thornycroft Hartley, being a man of the cloth, he ended his days 26 years later as a canon of Ripon Cathedral and a rich man. I mean, who could possibly have thought? that their destinies would have been so wildly different you know, as, they, as they faced one another across the net on the lawns of Wimbledon in 1879. I mean, you, you couldn't have made it up. I mean, Gould's wife, Marie, she died in uh, Montpellier prison in uh, 1914 from uh, typhoid. And just as a postscript of the story, uh, when the news of the trial spread, an American newspaper investigator got whiff of a story and he discovered that far from being dead from a falling off his horse, as De Vere first claimed, or let Ronnie. <laughs> He claimed that the same brother had been murdered by Ned Kelly. Um, Via de Gaulle's older brother was very much still alive. And he was discovered by this investigator living in a little town called Gladstone just outside Adelaide, where he was working as a ganger on the railways. When his father had died, he'd obviously been informed that he was now the fourth baronet. But being a simple ganger on the railway, he, uh, he kept it very secret. Nobody knew. Um, he didn't have the money to, uh, 
to live like a baronet, as many people <laughs> would have expected. And uh, his mates on the railway, I mean, they would have just taken a mickey out of <laughs> something awful. So he'd said nothing. And uh, when this American investigator, as it were, outed him, uh, this this chap was not <laughs> was not very pleased about it. Uh, this chap who was officially the, the fourth baronet, Sir James Stephen de Gould, a sort of strange name for a ganger on the railway, and he he had no contact with his younger brother Via for more than thirty years. I mean, he didn't even know where he was. So the fourth baronet, this chap from Gladstone in Australia, he died in 1926. But the title lives on in Australia, believe it or not. I had to make a new end for this, the editing suite kept chopping the end off the other, off the other version. In 2003, the eighth baronet, a chap called Sir George William Gould lived in a small terraced house at 180 Hargrave Street in Sydney. I mean, it's the Paddington area of Sydney. I mean, it's, it's, a sort of, it's a bit upmarket, but nevertheless, it's, it was a small house. And more to the point, he has a son and heir. Uh, a chap called George Leopold Powell Gould. Good name for a nutty hat. <laughs> and he studied, I think it was business studies at, at, at Kobe or Kobe University in Japan. So the dynasty still lives on, uh, albeit in Australia. I mean, I wonder if he, I wonder if he knows what his, what his great, 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 however many great, <laughs> it is, uncle, V. A. got up to in 1907. I suspect he does, <laughs> but he, but he keeps it under wraps. Anyway. It's a hell of a story from Clonmel in Tipperary via High Society in Dublin and London, Monte Carlo, and ended up on Devil's Island in French Guyana. What a life. <laughs> Beware, flirty French ladies. Anyway, we'll see you again. Cheerio.